Hi, everyone. I am very happy to be welcoming you to today's webinar. I am Samina Petrofi, and I am EMSP's Community Manager, and I'll be your host for today. Um, welcome to today's webinar on young people's uh, webinar on connecting N MS, NMOSD, and MOGAD. I am joined today by Sara Mariotto, who is a doctor, and she's working at the Verona University Hospital, um, as well as Sumaira, and she's the founder and the CEO of the Sumaira Foundation. So the aim of today's webinar is um, to raise awareness of um, very similar conditions to MS, such as MOGAD and NMOSD, and most importantly, to connect uh, the two communities, the young communities of people living with MS, MOGAD, and NMOSD, and um, to give people with MS substant substantial knowledge in order to help and support um, the new community that is now arising. arising. So, Sarah, over to you. Thank you. Thanks for the nice introduction. Um, happy to meet you, everyone. Uh, and I'm more than happy to share this webinar with Sumaira, who is a, yeah, a great friend. Uh, and also, uh, and I think uh, she's doing a great work uh, making uh, together doctors and patients. So yeah, just my, really my pleasure to do it uh, together with her. So I will share my screening. Um, can you see it? Yeah, we can. Perfect. So um, um, my idea is uh, uh, to, to tell you something about uh, the similarity and differences between NMOSD, MS, and, and MOGAD. Um, if you have any doubts, please just ask me if I'm not clear or if something is just uh, to you, it's, it's not clear, just, just tell me. So the main, dif the main uh, point with MOGAD and uh, NMOSD is uh, uh, the presence of the antibody. Uh, in case of MOGAD, it's uh, uh, antibodies targeting MOG, which is on myelin, oligodendrocyte. In case of NMOSD, it's usually, although not always, uh, aquaporin-4, which has the main target, the astrocyte. And this is the main difference with multiple sclerosis, where, as you know, we do not have a specific antibody which identify the disease. So going a little bit on the pathogenesis, um, as for uh, neuromyelitis optica, we have an unknown trigger factor, which then <clears throat> promotes the activation of the immune system like uh, B cells, T cells, the plasma blasts. They produce the antibodies which enter the um, blood brain barrier, which uh, is the barrier which limits the entrance of uh, antibodies, infectious diseases and whatever into the nervous system. Uh, and then after entering the nervous system, they, uh, they damage the astrocytes and induce uh, after a damage to myelin, neurons, and oligodendrocytes through an activation against also into the CNS of uh, uh, the immune system. On the other end, with MOG, we still have an unknown trigger who activate uh, B cells producing MOG-specific antibodies. And then once again, with the help of T cells, so the immune system, these antibodies enter the nervous system once again through the blood brain barrier. And in this case, they damage myelin once again through the activation of the immune system into the CNS and also through all the cytokines that you can see in the right. So the process is very much similar, although the target is different. And I just want to discuss with you. Um, I prepare a few tables to discuss with you the differences uh, in the uh, demographic data, clinical data, radiological data between the three conditions. I do not want to go into details with numbers, but um, as you can see here, multiple sclerosis is, is much more common than NMOSD and MOGAD. Um, another thing is that uh, multiple sclerosis prevalence is different in different parts of the world. Uh, while it, for MOGAD is not the case, it's similar all around the world, although it's much less. NMOSD is less common than MS, but also the prevalence is different around the world. As you can see here, also the female to male ratio is different. In the multiple sclerosis, we have a slight female predominance. The female predominance is much higher in NMOSD, while it's almost one-to-one -one in MOGAD. Also, the age at onset is different because for multiple sclerosis, you can see that the median is 29 years old and is really rare in children and also in old adults. 
So whenever we see a children, a child, sorry, with multiple sclerosis, we, we tend to put in doubt the diagnosis, which because it's really very much rare in children. You can see that NMOSD usually has an onset around 35, 40, 45 years old, but we have a wide range. Also, NMOSD is extremely rare in children. On the other hand, for MOGAD, we have a wide range, but MOGAD is very much common in children. So whenever we see a child with uh, uh, an inflammatory demyelinating conditions, we have to first to think about MOGAD which, because it's the most common. Uh, there, are, there are some associations, some triggers, although as I mentioned before, the trigger is mostly unknown, but maybe some of you read the influence of EBV infections in multiple sclerosis, which is much more common than in the general population. As for NMOSD and MOCAT, there are no study on EBV, although we would like to perform some. Uh, but for NMOSD, we know that in most of cases, there is no trigger. But I have to mention that in all the patients, in some cases, we found out some tumors, which is usually found only in old cases. As for MOGAD, um, it can be, the onset can be in around half of cases after infections or vaccination. So it seems that we do not have a specific infection, but it seems that infection could be a trigger for the immune system to produce antibody against MOGAD. As for symptoms, you are probably unfortunately familiar with symptoms of multiple sclerosis. Um, but I just want to mention here that, as you can see, symptoms are similar in multiple sclerosis, NMOSD, and MOGAD. But if you go into the details, they are quite different, and also outcome is different. Let's talk about, for example, of optic neuritis. In patients with multiple sclerosis, it's usually monolateral, and the involvement of the, of the optic nerve is usually short, so it doesn't involve the whole length of the optic nerve, and usually the involvement is of the anterior part. Usually, uh, the optic neuritis is mild or moderate, and the outcome is quite favorable after treatment. For, for neuromyelitis optica, usually the involvement is bilateral, more posterior with chiasma we say involvement, so the posterior part of the optic nerve, the one which is connected with the brain. Optic neuritis is usually severe, and we have a risk of poor recovery. As for MOGAT, once again it's bilateral, but similar to multiple sclerosis is anterior, and similar to NMSD is usually severe, although the outcome is usually favorable. So you can see that uh, although we have, can have optic neuritis in all the three diseases, if you go into details, it's different. It's, the same is for myelitis. In multiple sclerosis, it's usually short. In, in more the lateral part of the spinal cord and the posterior part, it's mild to moderate. And usually, it, ha it has a good recovery. As for neuromyelitis optica, the involvement of the optic nerve is usually longitudinally extensive, so very long. Uh, usually, the involvement is more common in the cervical spinal cord, so the part which is more connected with the brain, <laughs> severe, and unfortunately, once again, we have a risk for poor recovery. It's important to mention that we can have a residual bladder impairment, which is not so common in multiple sclerosis. As for MOGAD, the spinal cord involvement can be short or long. Usually, we see an involvement of what we call the gray matter, so with typical H sign, which is typical for MOG, usually the involvement is in the lower part of the spinal cord, the conus. Unfortunately, it's severe, but we tend to have an excellent motor recovery, which is good. Although we can have residual sphincter symptoms. Also for brain, as you probably know, in multiple sclerosis, we have typical white matter and corpus callosum involvement with cortical or, or subcortical and periventricular lesions, which are the hallmark of multiple sclerosis. While in NMOSD, we have usually an involvement of the brainstem, which is the lower part of the brain. And in MOGAD, we can have a widespread involvement of the white matter. So in all these diseases, we can have involvement of the brain, but the radiological features are different, and we will see them later. Also, this course is different because, as you probably know, most of cases of patients with multiple sclerosis have relapses, remitting course. So they can have relapses over disease course, although some of them can have a progressive course, either primary, so from the beginning, or after a relapsing course. 
In NMOSD, we have relapses, unfortunately, in 80-90% of cases. So it means that uh, we have almost uh, um, relapses in all of these patients. That's why we treated all of them after the diagnosis. As for MOG, we have a monophasic, so only one event in around half of cases, and the, in the other half, we have relapses. But unfortunately, we are not able to predict which one will relapse. So I think that one of the main focus of, of our project, our researchers, will be to identify patients who will relapse, because we do not know who to treat. Another point to mention is that, as you probably know from the visits, uh, we have a disability scale in multiple sclerosis, which is the EDSS. So it's made from different points. And we have this disability scale, which is performed every visit and help clinicians to know if we are stable, we have a progression, we are doing well or not. Unfortunately, we do not have specific disability scales for NMOSD and MOGAT. And that's also another point where we have to work on. And just to mention, I mean, I don't want to go into the details of the MRI, but um, I just want to show you that the MRI of neuromyelitis optica aquaporin 4 seropositive, which is the first one, um, is different from MOG. You can see that you can have a, a, a longitudinal involvement of the spinal cord, and these lesions, the white, the white ones that you see in these images in the brain, while in MOG, you can see in the second image on the left, on the bottom of the panel, you can see brainstem involvement. And then in the last one on the right, uh, this uh, cervical spinal cord involvement. And then on the bottom right, this fluffy widespread lesions. So MRIs can be similar, but we have uh, some clear differences. And I also like this uh, paper very much because um, you can clearly say the differences between uh, um, brain and optic nerve lesions in MOG, aquaporin 4, NMOSD, and multiple sclerosis. So what I said before about the involvement of the optic nerve, it's clearly mentioned here. It, ten it tends to be bilateral in uh, MOGAD and NMOSD and monolateral in multiple sclerosis um, as, it, as, it, as it's different the pattern, the pattern of announcement after contrast. And also you can clearly see that an anterior involvement is more common in MS and MOGAD and the chiasma posterior involvement in aquaporin 4 neuromyelitis optica. So here you see a comparison between um, the optic nerve involvement of these diseases. Um, most of you probably also underwent a spinal tap, which is, I know, not good for patients, but it's very informative for clinicians. Uh, because in multiple sclerosis, you can find out an increase of cells in the spinal, but when we analyze the CSF taken from a spinal tap, uh, but in NMOSD and MOGAD, we see a much more increase of cells. But another point very much important is that in multiple sclerosis, we almost always see oligoclonal bands, which are the hallmark of the production of unspecific antibodies into the CNS by B cells. And this can, can be found also in NMSD and MOGAT, but they are much less common. That's why it's very much important to do the CSF tap, especially in MS, to confirm the presence of oligoclonal bands, which are also part of the diagnostic criteria. But uh, speaking about diagnosis, I told you before that the uh, NMOSD and MOGAD are characterized by the presence of antibodies, usually because in around the 20, 30% per percent of patients with neuromyelitis op optica, we do not find uh, specific antibodies, but it, most of them we find around 70, 80%. And these antibodies target, uh, as I told you before, astrocytes and in particular, the aquaporin channel. Just to mention that there are diagnostic criteria for NMOSD, and here I reported them for you. And the main point is that if we find the antibody, aquaporin for antibodies, we need uh, to, to, be, to have um, a one core clinical characteristic, which, which means, of course, that the clinical spectrum has a, um, to satisfy these criteria, which I mentioned also before, optic neuritis, acute myelitis, brainstem involvement, and to find out the antibodies. The main point is that if we do not find the antibodies, we can have an MOSD, but we have to be very strict. We, have, we need at least two core clinical characteristics and also to satisfy additional MRI requirements. So 
it's very much important to try to find out the antibody in the best way we know. And in case we do not find, to be sure that we satisfy this uh, diagnostic criteria. Um, just to mention, this is a study that we are performing, as I also discussed it with, with Sumaira recently, um, where we analyze seronegative and NMOSD, which I think is very much important because we are trying to find out there an antibody and the signal of the immune activation. And in some seronegative patients, we found an immunological profile which was similar to that of aquaporin-4 seropositive cases. So I think it's a field where we should work on more, but it's very much important to study these cases to understand what we have to give them as treatment and what's happening there. As for MOGADs, um, also here we have the antibodies, but as I mentioned, they are different. We found that MOG antibodies um, in S4 NMOSD, we analyze usually only serum because uh, as I mentioned in the beginning, when we discuss about the pathogenesis, the antibody are produced in the periphery. As for MOGADs, I will show you later, um, it's good to analyze the antibodies in both serum and CSF. The technique is the same. So um, I, I just want to sh briefly show you how we found because I also work in the lab, I'm a clinician, but I also um, perform the diagnosis. So how we found it and we tested the antibodies. So we used an immortalized kidney, kidney line of cells that we transfected with, with the peptide of MOG. These little cells express on the surface the antigen, the MOG or the aquaporin-4 antigens. Then we put on the serum and the CSF or the CSF of patients. We use a fluorescence antibody and we look at it at the microscope. And here is, it is up here. Here in green, you can see the cells, these cells that I mentioned at the beginning, uh, which are green. So they are correctly transfected with the MOG or aquaporin-4 peptide. And in red, you can see a patient which is positive for these antibodies. Uh, this is a long process because it needs like three days to perform it, but it allows you to find out if that patient has or not the antibodies. And uh, I mentioned before that it's good for MOGAD to search for the antibodies also in the CSF. Um, we recently published a couple of studies. This was the first, and then I show you the other, uh, where we found some patients which were seronegative for aquaporin-4, did not satisfy the MS criteria, um, but added the MOG antibodies in the CSF only. To confirm this, uh, this data, we recently performed a multi-center study where we analyzed both serum and CSF of patients with uh, a, a compatible diagnosis, and we divided them in those which are the, the MOG antibodies in serum only, in both serum and CSF, and in CSF only. Just to mention, we also included some multiple sclerosis patients as controls, and we did not find these antibodies in none of them. So it doesn't make sense to test these antibodies in patients with, with multiple sclerosis because they define a different disease. So to mention our results, as you can see here, most of patients had MOG antibodies in serum and CSF. Some of them, 31%, had the antibodies in serum only, but we also noted 31 cases who had the antibodies in the CSF only. And um, these patients with CSF only antibodies were usually adults, more common had symptoms of myelitis, uh, almost all had a compatible diagnosis of MOGAD, and they had increased disability at the last follow up as if the presence of the antibodies in the CSF could be linked with a more severe phenotype. Um, we have criteria. So we had, up to yesterday, we had uh, some proposed criteria for MOGAD, but I have to mention that yesterday, uh, a great paper was published on the criteria for MOGAD. So this is a, a great relevance in this field. Uh, so now we are able to do a diagnosis of MOGAD according to diagnostic criteria, which are based very much on uh, the use of, on the diagnostic test that we use. Anyway, we need to have a compatible phenotype, as I mentioned before, optic neuritis, myelitis, brain symptoms. Um, then it's different if we have a clear positive or borderline positive results. But one important thing, of this criteria is that they say that we should not test the patient with multiple sclerosis for MOG, and we should not test those with aquaporin-4 because these three diseases are mutually exclusive. And then they discuss about the, the characteristic that I mentioned before. 
So as for MS, most of you know that uh, for making a diagnosis, we need compatible symptoms, compatible radiological features, and I mentioned before the importance of oligoclonal bands. I just want you to show which, which, what are these oligoclonal bands. And this is a run that we perform in our lab, uh, where you can see different red columns. On the borderline on the right and on the left, you find a control. And then we run paired serum and the CSF. And you can clearly see in the first case from the right, which means the second and the third row, you can clearly see that in the third row, we have these uh, lines, which are red dark, uh, which means that we have oligoclonal bands. So these bands, which are present in a CSF only, and as I mentioned before, they are mark, they mark an inflammatory process within the CSF. It, this is very much important because the presence of oligoclonal bands allow to do a diagnosis of multiple sclerosis. So of course, it's not easy to make a correct diagnosis and different, differentiate correctly these three conditions. But I try to, to, to show you that there are all marks of one and of the other two, um, but there are also some symptoms which are compatible with all the free diagnosis. However, we have a specific diagnostic criteria. As I mentioned, we have antibodies in NMOSD and MOG that we do not have in multiple sclerosis, um, but um, it, it, it's not easy to be correctly oriented in this field. So in any case, if you are confused about uh, these three conditions, you can of course ask me whatever you want, but uh, first of all, you have to refer to your doctor. And I know that they perfectly know the criteria, the diagnosis, and what they should do to diagnose correctly these three disorders. Um, just to go into the end of my talk, um, it's important to differentiate these three diseases because different, uh, the treatment is very much different. I have to mention that in the acute stage, the treatment is almost the same. Uh, you probably know that uh, um, patients with multiple sclerosis are usually treated with steroids, while NMOSD and MOGAT patients are also treated with steroids, but immunoglobulins or plasma exchange can be added to remove the antibodies if they do not respond well. And in MOGAD, it's also important to do a slow decalage of corticosteroids. But different is the treatment in the chronic state. So we have many, many different treatments for multiple sclerosis. We have now some treatments which are approved also for NMOSD, and there are ongoing trials for MOGAD. Um, of course, there are also some open questions for multiple sclerosis is how to treat uh, the progressive phase and how to evaluate the treatment effect. For NMOSD is uh, know something more about the novel treatment and about pregnancy. We do not know so much. And of course, uh, how to treat seronegative cases because most of them were not into the trials. As for MOGAD, it would be good to know uh, how long we should treat patients and who we should treat because as I mentioned, only half of them relapses. And as I told you, there are no approved therapy up to, up to now, but there are some ongoing trials. So here I just want to, to share with you uh, some of the most relevant fun papers where I took the data that I discussed with you. So if you want to have more information, you can search for that. And my last slide is this one because um, um, I, it's of course, a, it's a photo of me and Sumaira uh, working together because uh, I think it's very much important for, for all of us to know that we should always put the patient in the middle. And it's very much important for clinicians and researchers to, to, to work together with patients to do our best for patients, which are really the, the focus of our daily work. Thanks. Thank you, Sarah, for this uh, beautiful introduction and giving your expert opinion and on the three different diseases. And thank you a lot for putting the photos up of the MRI. I think that was very clear to me, and I hope it was clear to, to the rest of the audience as well. Do you have any questions to Sarah? If you want, you can just um, unmute yourself and ask it or use the raise a hand. Uh, there is a thank you from Georgina from Greece. Thank you for being here, Georgina. Um, if there are no questions, I have a question to Sarah. Um, so there, are, a vision is affected throughout all three uh, diagnoses. And I wanted to ask if there are different ways in which the vision is affected. And I'm asking this because I was recently at a conference in Germany and they had a, an image and how people with MS 
experience vision problems and how people with NMO experience them differently. So are there any specific studies or can you tell us more about it? Yeah, so um, a vision is uh, affected differently and this is linked with the different involvement of the optic nerve that I showed you before. Um, so for example, there are some OCT studies which show that the involvement of the optic nerve is different in the free conditions. And this is because the target is different. So uh, of course, the symptoms of optic neuritis are similar in the free diseases, but the way in which the optic nerve is involved is different. So as I showed you before, the anterior part versus the posterior, an extensive versus short involvement, a periasmatic or periorbital versus orbital involvement. So although symptoms can be the same, so one the patient come to us and say, I can see, I have pain in my eye, I can see the colors. Um, then uh, the way in which we see the OCT or the MRI is very much different. And this helps making the diagnosis and also explain why a recovery is different. Okay, thank you. So patients can see it the same way because I saw a photo in which uh, people living with a mess would usually see what, what they classify as a cloud over their eyes, where some, um, some people living with different con conditions see double. Yeah, so um, the point is that um, uh, the, the symptoms of optic neuritis can be the same, but the, um, the part of the visual field which is involved can be different. This is because okay. it's the central versus peripheral part of the optic nerve which is involved. And this is why um, the part of the optic nerve and the, also the monolateral versus bilateral involvement is different. Um, but usually they always say to, to clinicians, you know, I can see very well, I have pain. And this is the classical symptoms of optic neuritis. Although the part of the visual field and also um, the type of color involvement can be different. Okay, perfect, that's clear. Um, are there any other questions? I can see you. Okay, if there are no more questions, I think we'll move forward from the expert perspective to the patient perspective. So we have with us Sumaira Ahmed who will um, tell a little bit more about her own story and then uh, we'll exchange um, perspectives at the end. So Sumaira, over to you. All right, let me figure out how do I share my screen? Okay, Sara, great, uh, great presentation, obviously. <laughs> okay, can everybody see my screen? Uh, we can now. Okay. Um, well, we can well, hello. see it. Yeah, it's ah, perfect. It's okay. great. Hi everyone, uh, my name is Samira. I am a patient living with neuromyelitis optica, so NMOSD. I am uh, from the United States, I'm based in Boston, but actually right now I am in Rome, in Italy. I was uh, working with Dr. Sara Mariotto here, so uh, very, very happy to be here. And uh, thank you EMSP for having me. Um, I am very excited to share with you all what, uh, how I kind of turned my disease journey into what is now the Samaira Foundation. Um, so this was me on June 29th, 2014. I was 24 years old and um, this was the last day before I had NMO. And it used to be really difficult for me to look at this picture because when I look at this picture, I see a young, naive, bubbly girl who had no idea what was coming her way. But uh, in the span of, you know, a night, uh, the next day is really when everything kind of happened for me. And as you can see here, things really went from bad to worse in a matter of weeks. First, I lost my vision. And then I, you know, had a lot of trouble walking, feeling numbness, pain, weakness, all of the above. But I was very grateful because within six weeks of my onset, I was correctly diagnosed with neuromyelitis optica. And I do believe that early detection is what saves lives and really salvages the quality of life for patients and their caregivers. So I came home from the hospital after being diagnosed with a rare disease that nobody heard about. And I'm like, what do I do? I just turned 25. Like my life is supposed to be amazing at 25. You know, you're young, you're hot, you're skinny, you're traveling, whatever. And all of a sudden I now have this rare disease that nobody had ever heard of. And I was starting chemotherapy. It made no sense to me. 
So when I was in bed rest, I came home and I said, you know what, I got to do something about this. So uh, in September 2014, so just a month later, I worked with Boston Magazine, which is a major publication where I live, to announce that I was going to start a nonprofit to raise awareness of neuromyelitis optica. Now, understand that at the time, the MOGAD antibody had not even yet been discovered. So we started with just being dedicated to NMOSD. Today, we are a global nonprofit organization, almost nine years old this year, and we are dedicated to illuminating the darkness of NMOSD and MOGAD. Our vision is to illuminate the darkness. Um, as I said, we're dedicated to, here we go, awareness, community, advocacy, and research. These are our four pillars, and everything that I will talk about in my presentation relates to one of these four pillars. Sometimes they overlap. And as you can tell, I love color. I love cheery things, positivity. I think a positive mind really goes a long way. And for me, I think it was life-changing to have a positive mindset. So I hope that this inspires you all as well. Uh, some of our guiding principles, you know, I am a patient myself, and I think that that has been something that's really differentiated us from some other advocacy groups. So I always believe that patients should be first. I believe that a positive community is what is so powerful. Empathy always, and we are driven by science. So we are very pro-science. I, uh, If it wasn't for science, we wouldn't be here today, in my opinion. And of course, we are therapy agnostic. These are some of the pharmaceutical companies that we work with. Um, we are very lucky to be working with these therapy makers. So grateful that they make these drugs for us that keep us alive and well. This is some of our team members. I just noticed it's all women. So that's awesome. I'm a bit of a feminist. So uh, happy to be, you know, have a very strong team of women. Um, our ambassadors, we have global ambassadors who are patients and caregivers all around the world. This is actually a bit of an outdated slide because now we have 48 ambassadors and this slide was just from December. So we are definitely growing on a weekly basis. Um, as you can see from some of our statistics, diversity, equity and inclusion is a huge part um, of of you know, our ethos, it underscores what we believe in. I myself am a child of immigrants. I'm clearly um, a person of color. And uh, I believe that, you know, everyone deserves to have a voice. Everyone deserves to be represented. And so we are very proud of our diverse, colorful, gender, you know, agnostic team all around the world. These are some of the physicians on our Global Medical Advisory Board. Again, this is a bit outdated even from December. We have since added three more doctors, two from Australia and one from the UK. Um, this is a very important program for our, uh, our organization, Voices of NMO. It was the first program we ever launched back in 2014. So it's essentially a storytelling platform um, where patients, caregivers, doctors, researchers, advocates are able to share their stories and their perspectives of how NMOSD or MOGAD has affected their lives. Um, just here alone, we have patients, caregivers, uh, Dr. Sara Mariotto and Teresa Burke. She's an MS nurse in Australia who is super dedicated to both diseases. So really cool to have all these perspectives. Our website is also available in 10 languages. So you can read any of these stories or any of the content on our website in 10 languages. We will be adding more this year. I want to talk to you about some of our patient education programming. So uh, we have a webinar series called From the Experts. And in 2022, uh, we launched non-English webinars. So we have now had two in French, one in Arabic, one in Spanish. Sara Mariotto did one in Italian. We had one in Arabic. And actually, our next one is in German. So this is an NMOSD and MOGAD specialist from Munich who will be talking about, similar to here, um, the similar and differences between NMOSD, MOGAD, and MS, all in German. These are live and patients and caregivers, and actually anybody who attends has the opportunity to get their questions answered in real time. So this has been a very popular program for us, and we're grateful to our sponsor. Um, we also did uh, some French programming in Canada um, featuring patients and doctors in the same setting. So we believe that that intersection and conversation between patients and doctors is super insightful and important. 
We have a podcast that's now in season three um, called Demystifying NMO and MOG. And again, this is an intersection, a conversation between all different types of stakeholders who are involved in these diseases. You know, in my opinion, uh, we all kind of operate in this solar system and patients are at the middle. And I, I, I sort of visualize doctors, caregivers, researchers, advocates, industry partners, lobbyists, poly, policymakers, all of the above, sort of the other planets around the patients. And we all need to work together and communicate together. So this is a, another really great example of bringing these stakeholders together in meaningful conversations. In 2022, we started filming a documentary about NMOSD and MOGAD. So I had the honor and pleasure of traveling around Europe last year, filming uh, real patients, interviewing them, their families, um, you know, their friends, their employers, their doctors. This is Matthias Fuchs. He is our German ambassador, really, really cool guy. Here are some behind the scenes images from when we were filming in France. Here are some behind the scenes images from when we were filming in Germany. My hope is to get this series available on Netflix and Apple TV sometime you know, this year or next year. We're actually submitting to the World Health Organization Film Festival, so uh, keep your fingers crossed. But you know, visibility like this could be really huge for a rare disease like NMOSD and MOGAD because then we start reaching people who you know may not even be connected to rare disease, but now they know about it. So we're really excited about this. We um, have a lot of community programming. So book club is uh, something we do once a month. We choose books that are relevant to our community that are available also by audio since many of our patients are visually impaired and we have uh, stemmed off of this by also introducing a meet the author event so i don't know if you guys know this lovely young woman her name is Susanna Kahalen. she actually has um, autoimmune encephalitis she is american uh, she wrote a book about what happened to her she sold two million copies it became a new york times bestseller and then netflix made a movie about it and she was off to the races so we did a meet the author event with her to learn Learn about her journey and how, you know, really uh, taking her story to the next level by publishing a book that reached millions of people. Uh, I, I highly recommend you watch the interview. It's on our YouTube channel, but it's really, really cool. If you are someone who expresses yourself through writing and have interest in writing a book about what happened to you, um, she's a really wonderful example of what's possible. Um, this is also a very special program for us, the Human Collective Project. We launched this during COVID, the height of the pandemic in 2020, realizing that the uh, immunocompromised community was the most vulnerable when it came to COVID. And we felt so, so, so isolated and scared. So we decided to launch our support group meetings online. And so now, we have um, support group meetings every week in the UK, South Africa, Germany, Canada, the US, Denmark, and actually next month we'll be launching in France and in the Netherlands. Here we have pictures from our first patient day that we did last in the fall in Milwaukee in 2023. You will be seeing us kind of all over the place doing the same. In fact, um, we'll be hopefully doing one in Italy with Sara Mariotto in May. So uh, really cool stuff to bring patients together. Some people have never met other patients before. So it's really, really special to witness and observe these interactions in person. The doctors come too. We all you know, learn from each other. We have great, meaningful, rich and enriching discussions. So um, this this is something I'm really looking forward to bringing to the community this year. Oh, our lovely unicorns. So um, the mascot, I guess the unofficial mascot for the Samira Foundation is a unicorn. And uh, there's a bit of a story behind it. It's a little bit sad. So I won't, uh, I'll, I'll spare you guys some tears because I always end up getting very emotional when I talk about it. But really it's to honor a little girl who uh, lost her battle to NMO when she was six years old. She loved unicorns so much. So we created these unicorns. And now uh, when we become aware of pediatric patients anywhere in the world who have NMOSD or MOGAD, we send them um, unicorns with bracelets and a handwritten card from me. And it's just something to make them feel better and less alone. 
We also have a ton of support groups and pages for patients. So we decided to compile all of them in this wonderful document. It's a resource that can be found on our website. Um, they are organized by geography, by topic. So if you want a women's only group or something about pregnancy, you know, we've got a ton of um, support groups available to folks. In 2020, um, our community was very lucky to experience not one, but three FDA approved therapies for NMOSD that are soon going to be coming to Europe. And so we created a therapies chart so that you can see the therapies side by side um, in sort of a chart that outlines the side effects, the frequency, the dosing amount, you know, vaccinations and all of the above so that patients can have a, a conversation with their doctors about what is the best treatment for them. And in the United States, we call this shared decision-making. I'm sure it's something similar here, but as an organization, that's something that we really believe in um, because gone are the days when the doctor just writes you a script and says, here you go, that's it, this is your treatment. We now have options, so it's important for the patients to know what their options are and how to talk about it and how to discuss it with their doctors. Here are just some resources that we've come up with for patients, so Mugmentum to outline Mog. Um, we have some assistance funds in the U.S., uh, so these are groups that help patients with um, financial assistance if they need it. As you know, rare disease is very expensive. Uh, March is NMO Awareness Month, so the foundation is very big on doing a lot of activity, both virtually and in person, to illuminate the darkness of NMOSD during March, especially. Um, last year, we had our first European NMO Awareness Month campaign called Imagine My Life with NMO. Um, this was a campaign for folks to uh, express themselves creatively about how NMO has not stopped them from living their lives. So we received submissions from all over the world of folks, you know, painting, photography, singing, dancing, and what have you, just a really beautiful um, collection of creative expressions from patients around the world. April is MOGAD Awareness Month, so um, this will be the second MOGAD Awareness Month this year. We are involved in advocacy. I believe that the patient voice is super powerful and I think it needs to be elevated. It's actually more powerful than ever now. So use your voices. Um, I was very lucky to be invited um, to participate participate in updating the European guidelines for NMOSD and then also on a country level. So if there, there is an opportunity for you to get involved in this way, I highly recommend it. Uh, policymakers and politicians are more likely to listen to patient testimonials and be moved by that than maybe doctors. Unfortunately, that is the reality. Um, in 2022, I was featured in a documentary on PBS, which is I guess the equivalent of BBC in the in Europe, but anyway, this got a lot, a lot, a lot of views. Um, the the gentleman in the middle is his name is Dr. Sean Pettick. He is kind of like a godfather of NMO, so he was also featured in this. But we were very excited to have such great visibility about NMOSD because it had never happened before on this scale. So I was just very lucky to be a part of it. Um, also for advocacy, for March, we try to illuminate landmarks around the world pink, because it's my favorite color, <laughs> um, to, you know, raise awareness. So here there is a building in Boston that was lit up pink. The middle is Niagara Falls. And then the last is um, a bridge in Oklahoma. Our goal is to get 10 landmarks around the world lit up pink this year. So hopefully we can do that. Oh, this is my favorite slide. So. In 2018, the foundation launched its research program. So we give out research grants to um, physicians and researchers all over the world who are you know, trying to make breakthroughs in NMOSD and MOGAD. So these are all of the projects that we have funded. Um, since 2018, so about 600,000 US dollars uh, for these projects. I am hopeful that this year we'll break the million dollar mark, um, which I think is pretty impressive for a patient group. And again, just to show you that patients are not just patients, we're capable of doing a lot and accomplishing a lot. So you ask, how do we raise money for all of this? 
we do fun things like uh, cabaret for a cause. <laughs> so we have this fundraiser coming up and um, it's a dance class with dancers from uh, Crazy Horse Paris. I don't know if you guys are aware, it's similar to Moulin Rouge. These are cabaret dancers. This is just a small example of how we raise money, but they're gonna teach a dance class, a cabaret one, you know. Um, so one of the teachers will be sitting for those who are in wheelchairs and the other will be standing. So it's a nice routine that we all learn together, super fun. We also, I love to throw a good party, I'm not going to lie. So every year we have an anniversary fundraiser. This was from last year. Um, we turned eight last summer. We raised $75,000 from here. We have an annual gala every year that uh, is just my favorite. So these are just some pictures from our fifth annual gala in 2022 that happened in Boston. From this event, we raised $225,000, which all went to research and uh, actually we're gearing up for our sixth annual gala happening in Boston this April. Uh, very excited. We actually were too big for our last venue, so we had to switch our venue. So I think it's a good problem to have. Um, and then lastly, I just want to tell you a little bit about uh, our global expansion. So uh, I am a child of immigrants, as I established before, and early on in my illness, I always used to wonder what would have happened to me if my parents didn't immigrate to the U.S. when they did. So my parents come from a small country in Asia called Bangladesh, and actually the reality is, is that there are no neuroimmunologists in my country. In fact, the, the gold standard medication rituximab isn't even available in Bangladesh. So had I had my parents not immigrated to the U.S. 40 years ago, had I not grown up in the US, I may have died from NMO or I may be in a wheelchair or a much worse situation. And so I'm, I had this thought that, you know, there are patients all around the world who need our help. They need a TSF. Let's bring TSF to the rest of the world. So here is a slide from um, our work in China. We have um, partnered up with the largest patient advocacy or organization in China for NMOSD and MOGAD. They have 4,000 patients in their community. And I was on a webinar in May with them. I don't know if you can see the numbers, but there were 1,600 people on this webinar, which is definitely the largest audience I've ever had. Um, we have an organization in Canada. We have one in Germany. We have one in France that will be launching officially publicly next month. And then I am here in Italy because we are launching in Italy. So anyway, that is the end of my presentation. Thank you so much for listening. I am very happy to answer any questions, but um, you know, any opportunity that I get to talk to patients, caregivers, people in this space um, is really just a pleasure and an honor for me. So thank you so much. Thank you too. Thank you, Samara. Thank you for being here. And what an inspiring story. Um, I have a few questions from you because here we are mostly young people uh, with a desire to start their own group. And my question to you is, do you have any tips or what would you advise someone that is just starting? I definitely do. So um, I love to tell the story that when I was thinking about doing this, I Googled, how do you start a foundation? And it Google told me, oh, I think my camera just came yeah, out. Yeah, we lost your Oh, Sorry. Piece. Now you're back. Um, but... Here, I'll take this off. Let me stop share. Okay. So yeah, so Google told me that uh, starting a foundation took five easy steps. That is a lie. <laughs> it's not true. <laughs> I can not, imagine, yeah. Not true at all, but I'm glad that Google said that because I may have not done it otherwise. I, my best advice would be um, go into it with the right intentions. Go into it knowing that this is, um, it's not a sprint, it's a marathon. You know, things don't happen overnight. And being in Rome, I can tell you, Rome was not built overnight. You have to have patience and persistence and commitment. And again, doing things for the right reasons. I would also say that, you know, do a deep dive and an analysis of what the current landscape is in the, in the sense of it doesn't make sense to duplicate work. There is so much work that needs to be done in advocacy, awareness, community generation, research. So instead of doing what somebody else is already doing, do the things that aren't being done because that's 
that's actually how we'll be stronger as a community. So I would say do your homework, be prepared for late nights. You know, I actually was working full time. I had a full time career in healthcare administration. Um, for as long as I've been, you know, graduated from university. And when I was doing the foundation, I volunteered all of my time. So I was averaging about 80, 85 hours a week between my day job and volunteering for the foundation. So what I would say to that is that you really get what you put in. If you're putting in the hours, if you're putting in the work, if you're putting in the creativity and the strategy and all of that good stuff, then you will see the fruits of your labor. That's true. And you can witness it. We can witness it. So congratulations. Thank you. Um, are there any other questions from the public that somebody would like to ask? Either Sarah or Samira? Please don't be shy. We're young, I think, for the young yeah. people. Here. <laughs> <laughs> We're all young. And if not, what's age? Young at soul. Exactly. I have a few other questions. Yeah, if, yeah, uh, somebody does. Um, so Maybe I wanted to touch a bit on the importance of community after your diagnosis, because after your diagnosis, you wanted to build a community, you know, you build your own foundation. And why, why was that so important to you? Or, yeah. Yeah. Well, as you can imagine, you know, getting, getting sick with something so rare that no one around you knows about at a young age is really devastating. And uh, rare disease can incredibly isolating so my first question i had two questions when i first got diagnosed the doctor was like okay so we think you have this my first question was am i going to die and the second question was how do i meet another patient and i was being treated at the number one hospital arguably in the world at mass general brigham which is part of harvard medical school and they didn't know how to connect me to another patient and I thought to myself, well, that's crazy. Like, how am I going to deal with this? Like, I want to talk to another patient so that I can understand what the actual lived experience is life of pe is like of people. And it was really difficult for me to find another patient. You know, the landscape of NMOSD at the time was very, very different. And the landscape of MOGAD at the time didn't even exist. So I'm the type of person that, you know, if I can't find a solution, I'll just make the solution myself. And I thought to myself, if I feel this way, then there must be other patients who are feeling this way. So maybe there was something that I could do to bring this community together. So that's what I, I tried to do it. <laughs> yeah. Nice. Uh, Sarah, would you like to give your doctor perspective on the importance of um, community post-diagnosis? Yeah, so uh, yeah, I, I think it's uh, um, yeah, the most important thing for for docs, doctors is to discuss, uh, uh, we spoke a little bit about this with Sumaira, uh, uh, to discuss the diagnosis and so to, also treatment with patients. So in any way to put the patients uh, uh, in the center, because you know, there are now different treatments. Um, as I try to show you, making the diagnosis is not always easy. So I think it's really very much important to, to, to discuss together uh, about the, the disease, uh, about the connection with other patients, which, which I think is very much important for everyone who has a rare disease or in general a disease, and also to discuss uh, uh, about the treatment strategies. So it's not a one-way direction thing, but it's something that we, we, we try to do together. And I think this is very much important for the future. Yeah, that's beautiful. And I think that's also where organizations like DSF and EMSP come there to help patients and it's also our duty to contact the doctors and make sure that they know about us as well so it's good that we we make this bridge um are there any last questions before i move on to to the end i would just actually like to um give some unsolicited advice go for it so you know i when i came onto this scene nine years ago Patient advocacy obviously existed. It's existed since the beginning of time, right? But in the world of NMOSD and MOGAD, I, as a young person who was, you know, a, a digitally savvy, social media savvy, and like looking for connection so badly, I really could not find what I was looking for. What existed already was not enough for me. It just wasn't it wasn't satisfying to me. And that's when I decided to do things. And I had this thought that wow, patient advocacy really needs a makeover. Sorry, I always think in terms of fashion and style and makeup, <laughs> and this and that, but like, I was like, patient advocacy really needs a, a 
facelift. It needs a makeover. I'm sick and tired of people looking at patients as if, you know, they just feel bad for us or they're like, oh, we have to be nice to them because they're patients and patient advocates. No, no, no. None of us asked to be a patient. I was a high functioning, very successful businesswoman when I got sick. And so if it can happen, to me it can happen to anyone so if it's going to happen to you make the best of it show the world what we're capable of we are not just patients just because we're patients doesn't mean we should be walking around in a white sheet and having everybody's sympathy no through your patient advocacy show the world how powerful your voice is how much you can accomplish and that we are more than just patients we are equally as equally as capable if not more you know, for me, sometimes it's difficult to um, see what other people see when it comes to TSF, you know, because I only have, my vantage point is out here. I can't see what other people are seeing. But what I will say is that I'm proud of what we did because what we did was something different. We need to keep thinking outside of the box. So we need to be creative. We need to be innovative. And I think we really need to prove ourselves as patients that we need to be on the same playing field as everybody else. We are not here to get your sympathy we are here to make a difference we are here to inspire other people and other people and improve their lives so if you're going to do this take the opportunity to really show people how it's done beautiful what is beautifully <laughs> said and uh, i think what you said resonated with everyone here that let's just update and and kind of give a new face to uh, to patients advocacy. So thank you for being on this journey with us, Myra. And uh, we're more than happy to learn from you. Um, I have uh, one last request from the public. If we could take um, some photos for our socials, if it would be nice to see your faces. If you don't want to, that's more than fine. You can also change the name uh, in your Zoom if you click on the three dots that are popping up on the right corner of your of your screen. So I will share my screen. And then uh, my colleague, Patricia, will tell you one second. No. Oh, I see some familiar faces. Hi, Nikki. Hi, Davin. <laughs> <laughs> Long time. Can you see my screen? Yeah. Perfect. Would you be so kind as to take a photo, Patricia? A screenshot, maybe. OK. All righty. Thank you, Patricia. And I would like to take one last minute to thank our sponsors for this event. Um, as I always say, the content we are developed is independent, yet we are supported by our pharma uh, partners. Can you unshare the screen and then we could have everybody? Just of to know, course. Like, yeah. Okay, so now I can see everybody's face. Um, so you can you can strike a pose. Beautiful. <laughs> All right. Thank you. Thank you. Um, so this was it for today. 